Can you describe the work in the April 16th, 20th outbreak? Yeah, it was, uh, it was probably a once in a lifetime kind of experience. Um, you know, I remember coming in that day, I was off that weekend, but I was, uh, uh, needed to come in for overtime on that Saturday. Turns out that Sunday as well. But, uh, so I was working an overtime shift. I came in at around 11 AM, several days leading up to the event. It looked like it was going to be a, a significant severe weather episode. However, uh, we're, we're kind of used to getting these setups where there could be, um, you know, a, a major episode, but more often than not, it doesn't happen. And in this particular case, we we had a almost perfect setup for Central North Carolina. So there was a fair amount of uh, anticipation that we were going to see a significant severe weather episode. So about noon, I remember the Storm Prediction Center sent a chat on One Two Planet, which is the chat system that we use to uh, collaborate with other offices. And they were asked, uh, would you mind if we upgraded you guys to a high risk? And I was <laughs> somewhat taken aback by that because, uh, yeah, we never get high risks in North Carolina. Um, so I told them uh, you know, whatever in their best judgment they felt that uh, a high risk was warranted, then go for it. And they did. So on the 1630Z outlook, they upgraded us into a high risk, uh, which uh, at that point, uh, I was in new territory. Um, you know, aside from chasing out in the Midwest, I have not been in a high risk uh, in, the, in the Carolinas, nor have I seen one. I think the last one was probably in the early 90s. Uh, so, uh, so that was definitely uh, a, uh, a factor that uh, made you uh, even more nervous <laughs> when, when the event was about to start. So it started out, there was a line of thunderstorms um, developing in the foothills of the Carolinas at about, uh, about one o'clock or so, maybe a little earlier. And uh, th this line of convection started approaching the uh, Western Piedmont, so uh, you know, east of I-77, Charlotte, uh, Salisbury, Winston. And as it approached Central North Carolina, it, it moved into an increasingly favorable environment for, uh, for tornadoes. And we began to see circulations uh, within uh, individual cells along the uh, uh, the line of convection. And I remember issuing a tornado warning for, I believe it was Person County and then maybe Alamance, uh, probably Alamance first, then Person Counties. And th that's when convection was still in a line and it was what we call a quasi-linear convective system or QLCS variety of tornadoes where you get an individual cell within a line that produces a tornado. And so it looked like that may be the character of the event, which, you know, we, we've seen that kind of thing before, um, although the, uh, the setup was more favorable in this case. Um, so I, at that point, I, you know, which was probably 1.32 p.m., something like that, I, I, I thought that uh, it was going to progress in a way that maybe is typical of this area. Uh, however, <laughs> in about 2, 2.30 p.m., this line of convection actually breaks up and becomes discrete supercells. You could see it happening. And at that point, I knew that we were in a lot of trouble because classic discrete supercells like what we were starting to see evolve, uh, I've never seen that happen from a line uh, that is progressing from a line of convection into discrete supercells. That's unusual, especially around here, and uh, it's usually the opposite. So when we saw that happen, we knew that we were in a bit of trouble. And I believe Mike Moneypenny was working radar on the uh, Sanford storm. I think it started in, um, geez, Moore County, parts somewhere in Moore County. Um, and it moved up to Sanford, and it ended up producing an EF3 tornado. And at that point, we realized it was also heading right into central Wake County. And there were several other supercells, you know, that had uh, kind of developed from the line as they were, as it was progressing east. So there were other supercell storms out there as well that were, that were tornadic. Um, they were somewhat in a line, as you can probably see on the, the display back there. Um, and, you know, warning on those kind of storms, uh, it, it's actually easy to warn on those kind of storms because it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's in the bag, basically. You, you know it needs a tornado warning. It's like, oh, gee, okay, yeah. Do we need a tornado warning? Yeah. So 
you know, that from that standpoint, it was easy. However, there was the uh, serious nature of the event and that we had to make sure that the tornado warnings had appropriate impact statements. Uh, and in fact, we used tornado emergency and, and numerous warnings and severe weather statements that followed up the warnings. And that's something that I have personally never used uh, in North Carolina. I think it might have been used once before in a, in a previous event, but uh, but never on the scale that, w that we were going to use it that day. And so I think the major thing about issuing the warnings was that we needed to make sure that people understood this was this was distinct. This is something that happens once in a quarter century and we're going to have devastating tornadoes uh, similar to that what they get out in the Midwest. Um, so you know that in addition to that there's the kind of the personal factor right so not only or you know is it a serious situation for everyone well hey you know our families and uh, other staff members they're in the path of some of these storms and uh, at the time I lived in Holly Springs and the Sanford storm which uh, which had produced an EF3, almost an EF4, and had flattened, uh, I think it was a Lowe's hardware down in Sanford. That exact storm was going to hit my house, basically. Um, it was on path to directly hit Holly Springs. So from that point onward, it was pretty nerve wracking for me. One, trying to keep up with, you know, making sure that the warnings are out and that the impact statements were correct, but then you know, I, I called a few of my neighbors, um, let them know, hey, you know, the storm is headed right for the neighborhood. Do not mess around. It is coming. You've got about 30, 40 minutes. I'll try to give you a call back in a little bit. Uh, call everyone in the neighborhood that you know. Tell them to take cover, get in the center part uh, of the house on the lowest floor. Um, so, uh, you know, I was fairly nerve-wracking from that kind of standpoint. And the storm indeed hit Holly Springs, and luckily my neighborhood was okay. The tornado missed it by a quarter of a mile. So uh, uh, when I went home later on that night, there were trees down everywhere, power lines down. I had to take like three or four different detours to get home. Then when I get home, I find you know pieces of insulation on the yard and in trees. So debris had actually been falling from the sky near my house. Um, so you know throughout the rest of the event, you know as I was here working. Um, once I found out that, uh, my, you know, my neighbor actually got back with me and said, hey, hey, our homes are okay, I felt a little relieved at, at, at that point, um, at least that my, you know, uh, my home and that uh, friends and uh, some family members and, and, and Carrie were, uh, were going to be okay. Uh, so that, that relieved me a little bit, uh, but, you know, we still had the ongoing, uh, <laughs> you know, tornadic event going on. Uh, so the rest of it was just kind of following the, the, the storms um, uh, until it ended. There was one more thing, though. Uh, that same storm that hit Holly Springs ended up coming right toward the office. Um, I think Jeff Warrock talked uh, or noted to Darren, like, hey, this is coming right for us. So at that point, they started to plan what we would do if the storm held together and uh, actually hit the office, uh, which it looked like it could do. So, uh, you know, the plan is that we go down into a stairwell uh, and take shelter and, you know, run some concrete stairs on one particular side of the building. So uh, over the next, I'd say, like 10 minutes or so, uh, you know, this was probably about third when the storm was 30 minutes out. Over the next 10, 15 minutes, Darren eventually started getting, uh, you know, some of the personnel down into the stairwell, including a student who was here who was working with me, actually, who was sitting, who was sitting next to me. Uh, uh, throughout the event. Um, so, you know, he and some others went down to the stairwell first. Then as the storm got closer, most everyone else went down the stairwell. And uh, at, at some point, it was just me, Darren, and, and Jeff left out in operations. And we were making sure that warnings were in place downstream of the current storms and warnings. And that Blacksburg, who was going to be backing us up, if, you know, when we took shelter, um, that Blacksburg had everything ready to go. Uh, so the three of us were out there and, you know, once we had the warnings out, I, I, act, I really wanted to stay. I wanted to see what was going to happen. I told Darren I would have crawled under a desk if I had to. Um, you know, that I, I've seen this kind of stuff out in the Midwest before, but, uh, you know, you, you wanted me to go in the shelter and I think that was probably a good idea. So 
I ended up going into shelter, uh, you know, with uh, Jeff and the rest of everyone. And what was interesting is, you know, when we were in the stairwell, uh, the uh, lights started flickering and the power went completely out. So we were left in darkness in the stairwell. We were actually using our cell phones as lights and we were, you know, kind of nervously chuckling like, oh, I guess it hit us, maybe? We don't know. Um, so uh, after a few minutes went by and we, we knew the storm was passed, we ended up coming out of the stairwell and it smelled like pine, like pine trees. I remember that distinctly um, because of all the trees that were down nearby. Turns out the tornado missed us. I think it was by one or two miles, maybe two miles. Um, but it, it, it hit just east of us. And the most we got here, I think, were severe winds and maybe some hail with the uh, uh, severe inflow winds and then maybe hail on the backside of it. But uh, one thing before I took shelter that I, I particularly noticed was we had a northeast wind. Um, I could see the trees in the parking lot. We had a strong northeast wind. And the only way that we would have a strong northeast wind is if it was inflow. Um, wrapping into the, uh, the, the low-level mesocyclone on the storm. So that was really cool. I saw like 50 mile an hour plus winds. That's one of the last things I saw before I took shelter. Um, and uh, so after we came out of shelter, we, uh, you know, the generator was on, we had lost power. Uh, so we were running on a diesel generator that's outside. And you know, everything was still running because we had the generator, uh, the radar too, uh, even though a lot of areas around here lost power. So we went back to work <laughs> and uh, uh, we called Blacksburg, said, hey, we're okay, you know, we can still uh, uh, do our deal here. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take back over. And uh, so for the next two hours or so, we just kind of continued on and uh, uh, powered through it. And, uh, and then by, I think, about 7 p.m. or so, it was over.